pretty good. He plays good. He plays according to the rules. <laughs> okay. Jaya Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Jai Janavalava Girivar Ahi Hai Ed Hai Gopi Janavalava Girivar Ahi Hai Yasodanandana Brajadhyana Handhyanaya Yasodanandana Brajadhyana Handhyanaya Jamuna Thira Hevane Chahi Amuna Jamuna Tira Hevan Chahi Amuna Tira Ed Hair Hard Ham Hard of Ham Kunjabi Hari Kunjabi Ham Ed Hair Hard Ham Madhava Kunjavi Hari Kunjavi Hari 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 Ahead, I go be Janaval Abam. Get him out of town, honey. I go be Janaval Abam. It is so an undone. Raja Jamuna Tira Hevan Chahi Jamuna Tira Hevan Chahi Ed Hai Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Hey, good Jabi Hari. Ahead, higher, odd, hum, hot of hum, couldn't have he hung here. Couldn't have he hung. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama. Hari Hari Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Rivo Hare Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 
Krishna Krishna Hari 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 Ram Hari Ram 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 Hari 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 Krishna Rio Ram Ram Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Krishna, Krishna, Rama, Hare Hare. Hey, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, 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 Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, 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 Hare Hare, Hare Hare, Hare Hare, Hare Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama, Rama Hare Hare, Krishna Krishna, Rivo. Hey, Jaya Prabhu Para Prabhu Para Prabhu Para Shila Prabhu Para Prabhu Para Shila Prabhu Para Prabhu Para Prabhu Para Prabhu Para Jai Jai Prabhu Pa, Prabhu Pa, Prabhu Pa, Jai Prabhu Pa. Nethai Gaur Hari 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 Gaur Hari Gora Hari Gora Hari Hari Bhavan Nethai Gaur Hari Bhavan Hari Bhavan Hari Bhavan Hari Bhavan Gora Hari Hari Bhavan Nethai Gaur Sri Panchatattva Ke Dai Dila Prabhupad King Gaur Premanande Hare Krishna Mahamantra Ki Jai. So, today we'll break away from our normal series of verses and continue tomorrow with the Bhagavad Gita. Today is a special day. It's a celebration day. Uh, some places around the world, they really celebrate today, uh, depending on your location, especially if you're in Boston, Massachusetts. <laughs> and that is the uh, arrival of His Divine Grace, Chila Prabhupada, in America, September 17th, 1965, 5.30 a.m. in Boston Harbor, Boston, Massachusetts. This arrival changed the whole history of the world. The world was going in a certain direction. The history of the world changed. <laughs> Beginning of the Hare Krishna movement began on the arrival of His Divine Grace in the land of America. 
the story of Srila Prabhupada's trip to America and what he had to arrange before going is a great amount of information. It's a great text. And there are actually large portions of books. His Holiness Satsrup Maharaj has written Prabhupada's arrival in America in detail. And there have been other accounts. Songs have been sung, poems have been written, glorifications of Srila Prabhupada's appearance in the Western world mark the history of Krishna consciousness in the West. <coughs> Before I begin, I'll just give the old invocation, Omigyan Timirandasya, Ginajana Salakaya, Chaksa Unmilitam Yena Tasmai Shri Guruvena Maha, Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale, Sri Bhakti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamini Namaste Saraswati Devi Gauravari Pracharine, Nirasesa Sunyavari Pastyatya De Satarine, Panchakalpa Tarubhischa Kripa Sindhu Be Vajapatitanam Pavane Vyo Vaishnave Vyo Namaho Namaha, Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda, Shri Advaita Gadadhar Srivasari Gaur Vakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare The seed that was planted, that sprouted in the form of the Hare Krishna movement took place in the year 1922 in Calcutta. The address was one Uta Danga Junction Road. At that time, His Divine Grace, who was Abai Babu, he was a uh, student of Gandhi, follower of Gandhi, adhering to the nonviolent protests against the British uh, rule in India. And um, at that time, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati had uh, developed his mission. His mission was just beginning. And every night in Uta Danga, one Uta, Uta, Ultra Danga Junction Road, that place now belongs to ISKCON. <laughs> just last year, we actually uh, were able to get that place which was the beginning of the Hare Krishna movement. The so devotees uh, made so many arrangements for years and finally we were able to purchase that building. But at 7 p.m. in the evening, His Divine Grace, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, would each evening hold discourses on Chaitanya Charitamrita. And many people, not many, but groups of people would come mostly followers. Our Srila Prabhupada Abhay Babu was walking along with his friend Narendra Nath Mulek, who said to Abhay, you know there's a very nice saintly person and this evening he's giving those courses on the scriptures. I think we should go see him. So Prabhupada, our spiritual master, he said, oh these saintly persons, I know all about them. I'm not interested. <laughs> and Prabhupada comments on that. He said, when I was young, my father, he was very much was a great host. He hosted many sadhus and saints who would travel and come to stay. They would stay at my father's place and he would provide for them whatever they needed. Sometimes they would stay two, three, four days. And Prabhupada said, I was never much interested or inspired by any of them. <laughs> and so his idea of saintly persons weren't so, what we say, uh, good. So when he was asked by his friend Narendranath Mulik to come and see Bhakti Siddhanta, he said, I'm not interested. But Narendranath Mulik was, was not going to give up so in he. So he grabbed him by the arm, Prabhupada describes, and he dragged me. He literally pulled me. <laughs> Come on, we're going. <laughs> so we went. 
And there was a little discussion going on when we arrived. And Prabhupada describes, it is very customary to offer respects to a saintly person. So as I was coming in, I also bowed down. And while I was bowing down, he spoke. He said, oh, you are a very intelligent young man. You should take uh, Lord Chaitanya's movement to the Western countries. Whoa, <laughs> that was the first thing he ever said. They never met. <laughs> He's given me a lifelong instructions at the first time without any without any formal even introduction. <laughs> so I started thinking what he was saying, and then I responded, as Prabhupada described. Yes, this is a nice, but we are a dependent nation. And then for who will listen to our message? First we need Swaraj, we need liberation from the British. Otherwise, this, uh, our words won't have any meaning anywhere. So that was my argument, Prabhupada describes. And, uh, but he said, Bhakti Siddhanta said, this political party, this material situation, they will come and go, but Lord Chaitanya's movement is transcendental to all of this. So this is the need of the time. And then Prabhupada said, after listening to him, he said, I was defeated. <laughs> And then, of course, I listened to my, I would listen to the lecture. And then after we left, Narendra Nath Mulik, my friend, said to me, what do you think? Oh, I said, he is a very nice, saintly person. Lord Chaitanya's movement is in good hands. <laughs> so, and then, of course, Prabhupada was in, later on, not long after that, he was in Allahabad. India, which is known as, uh, you know, Prayag. And he had his pharmacy there, Prayag Pharmacy, that was the name, like that. And uh, so, it just so happens that some of Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati's disciples, Brahmacharis, came to Allahabad, and they wanted to set up some meeting there. So everyone said, well, if you want to set up some, there is a very nice, man here, he has a pharmacy. His name is Abai. You go and he will help you. So Prabhupada describes, they came. And they came to my pharmacy. And I said, oh, here are the disciples of Bhakti Siddhanta. I'm so happy. After a few years, I'm seeing them again. So then, of course, arrangements were made and programs were or went on and Prabhupada came to the programs and he was he would leave the kirtan and arrange for the programs like that. So this was how Krishna consciousness seed was planted, which eventually sprouted into this worldwide movement. And of course, Prabhupada describes his life, and it's a very detailed and interesting uh, scenario of how he was living with his family. He had five children. His business was flourishing. In fact, he became so expert at his business. Even the chemical companies around India, uh, Calcutta, what was it? Bengal Chemical and many of the other prestigious chemical companies, they were asking for my, for my commission. And I could make my own price. <laughs> and then, of course, Prabhupada said, when I was young, my, the astrologer, read my, my hand and said, actually, this person, he could be as wealthy as Bula. In other words, he would be one of the wealthiest persons in India. <laughs> the Prabhupada was destined to be a multi-multi-billionaire, I mean, by all standards. He had such uh, expertise in, in his, in his uh, trade. But by Krishna's arrangement, and after associating with the disciples of Bhakti Siddhanta, things started to change. And his business started to fall apart. And then family life became a little tense. His wife was not so much interested in Krishna consciousness. This, uh, this AC is going to kill me. Can we, uh, I, I, you know, I, I, bet I died before, but I don't want to die until this class is over. So. <laughs> Thank you.
AC, we like AC. AC, Bhaktivedanta, Swami, Jitarobhaki. We have a particular kind of AC we like. So, man, Prabhupada describes that later on, you know, things were falling apart in his business, and even some of his employees were cheating. So many things were going wrong. And then Bhakti Siddhanta, who had departed the planet on January 1st, 1936, um, he was appearing in my dreams, he said. My, my spiritual master was appearing in my dreams and he was saying, follow me, follow me. Prabhupada said, I was horrified. I was horrified. He's asking me to leave everything and become a sannyasi. Oh my God. I was horrified. And then the dream kept coming. In 1945 he had the dream. He had it in 41, 1941, and then again in 45, and then in 48. When, when it happened in 48, his business was practically gone. So he was more ready for, for hearing. So then, of course, gradually Prabhupada lost his business, his family was not at all supportive at all, and things just weren't going materially good at all. And Prabhupada describes it in retrospect. And he quotes one verse from the um, Srimad Bhagavatam, the 10th canto, chapter 88, where Krishna says, if I, if I really favor somebody, I give them everything. But if I, but I, if I favor someone, I give them everything. But if I really favor them, I take everything away. <laughs> special, special favor. <laughs> and then, the, then that person is abandoned by everybody else and all there is left is me, <laughs> Krishna. <laughs> so that's a special favor. If you get that, don't, don't reject it. <laughs> if you think every, if everything goes wrong in your life, you can consider Krishna, you're always, you favor me so much. Thank you. <laughs> so then, yeah, so then gradually Prabhupada went to Vrindavan. He stayed in Vrindavan for about four or five years living at the Radha Damodar temple. And just living there, he was actually writing uh, some of his purports, which were later the first canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, which were the books he took to America, the first three volume volumes of the first canto. And there are many, many wonderful stories. There's one book that was put out called Our Srila Prabhupada by my god sister Mula Prakriti. She's no longer on the planet, but she wrote this beautiful, beautiful and most amazing account. She interviewed people who were with Prabhupada during that time when he was at Radha Dharmadhar. The Pujaris, the local people. She met so many people. And in that book, she narrates all the dates. She just gives what they had said about Srila Prabhupada. <clears throat> and there's one narration there where actually Rupa Goswami and Jiva Goswami appeared to Srila Prabhupada in a vision and said, take our message to the Western world. Prabhupada had a vision, and it was actually Rupa Goswami that spoke to him. And he was telling him, yes, you are the person chosen by the Lord to take this, this mission of Lord Chaitanya to the Western countries. So if you get a chance, it's called Our Srila Prabhupada. It's such a beautiful book of so many amazing stories of how people that Prabhupada met, how he lived for the four or five years in Vrindavan. He had nothing. He was cooking himself with his little three-tier cooker. And throughout the day, he was just reading and studying. That's all he was doing the whole time. There was no running water. He had one old lady would bring some running water, some water from the Ganges for Prabhupada to cook and Prabhupada to bathe. She would do that every day. And uh, Prabhupada lived very simply. Um, and finally, of course, then he understood. And then, of course, 
more and more times Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati was coming to him. And finally Prabhupada, in 1959, and we talked about this not long ago in a recent class, he took sannyas in Mathura, from the Gaudiya Moth in Mathura under, under his uh, senior uh, godbrother Keshava Maharaj. That's a beautiful story how Prabhupada received sannyas. And then that was in 1959. And then after that, a few more years, Prabhupada prepared. And it wasn't until... And of course, during that time, Prabhupada... In 1944, actually, Prabhupada began Back to Godhead magazine. The first issue of Back to Godhead was, was just one or two pieces of paper. And Prabhupada was talking a lot about the political situation in the world at the time. And that was during the time of World War II. And so, you know, Prabhupada also talks about his personal experiences during the war. But he was putting out this one or two page paper, paper about Krishna conscious philosophy and connected with the world situation at the time. And then he would, that was coming out once a month. But Prabhupada was doing everything. He was writing it. He would take what he wrote to the printers, give it to the printers, go to the tea stalls in, in the areas of Delhi and around, collect a few pice so he could pay for it, and then pay for the printing and then bring it back and then distribute it by hand. So he wrote it, he had it printed, he paid for it, he collected the money to pay for it, and he also collected the money that he needed to sell so he could sell it and to print the next issue. Prabhupada was doing everything like that. It also talks about one time when Prabhupada was walking during the hot time of the season in Delhi and some bull came and gored him and knocked him down. And he was practically unconscious. And it was because of the heat and being hit by a bull. So Prabhupada had to go through a lot of physical difficulties. He was in his 60s at the time. It's not easy when you're 60 years old trying to, you know, develop. And of course, during that time he had started this one uh, little center in Jhansi, which is not too far from Delhi. He had received a building and he started what is called the League of Devotees. And he, had a, he, his first, he initiated his first disciple, his name was Prabhakar. <laughs> Prabhakar, he was Prabhupada's first disciple. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and Prabhupada was having meetings regularly there. But the place was uh, given to them by Bharati Vidya Bhavan. And then one of, the, one of the ladies, the lady who was the wife of the owner, she wanted the building for a sewing club for ladies. So she used her influence and pushed Srila Prabhupada out, he lost his whole building. So everything Prabhupada did in India failed. Completely failed. Everything he started, he had to work so hard, he put together things, it failed. And Prabhupada understood that, you know, Krishna is telling me, it, it's not India you're supposed to be, you're supposed to be in the West. <laughs> so when you sometimes you see, when you're trying something and it keeps failing over and over again, it means you're in the wrong place. <laughs> so Prabhupada kept failing. And finally, then he made his plans to go to America. That wasn't easy either. He had to get a P form, he had to get enough money for passage. So, of course, when he applied for the P form, which was the way to, you could go to America at the time, it was called a P form, uh, the office refused. The office refused. They said, where are you going to stay? Who's going to support you? You have no support. We can't give you. So, you know, Prabhupada finally went to the top man in the whole chain. He didn't take no for an answer on the lower level. And he talked to the top man. And finally the man said, he approved. And Prabhupada found a sponsor. And, uh, Gopal Agarwal. Gopal Agarwal was a, uh, he was a good friend. And uh, 
he had a son. Gopal Agarwal was actually the son who lived in America with his American wife named Sally. They lived in a place called uh, uh, Butler, Pennsylvania. In 2008, we were, we were in New Vrindavan, Butler, Pennsylvania to, from New Vrindavan is about a four hour car ride. So we decided to take all the devotees and we spent um, two days in Butler, Pennsylvania. We met Sally. We met, uh, we, of course, Gopal. Yeah, we also met Gopal. Gopal was also there. They were both in their late 70s at the time. And we, uh, we saw the place where Prabhupada stayed. Prabhupada had to stay in the YMCA, Young Man's uh, Christian Association, where they would give rooms to people who didn't have much money. You'd pay a few dollars and get a room in the night like that. So at first Prabhupada was staying with Sally Agarwal and Gopal, but it was really difficult. But I, I think I fast forwarded a little bit too, so we'll go back. So once he got his, uh, his permission, and uh, Mr. Agarwal informed his son, his son said, yes, we will sponsor him. Then Papa had to get, now he had to get to, in, to America. So how he was he going to do that? He didn't have any money. So um, he had made some friends with one person who worked for, um, what was her name? The one that owned Skindia Air, uh, Steamship. Somebody knows? What was her name? She was Indian. Um, do, 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 do. Huh? Yeah. Shimati Marariji. Yes, yeah, Shimati Marariji. She owned this uh, steamliner company where they would make uh, regular cargo ships going from India to countries. So Prabhupada asked for, you know, uh, you know, passage on her, on her thing. And she actually, she took an interest in Prabhupada. Prabhupada used to come to her and teach her Bhagavad Gita and she would listen. And then he asked her for her passage. She said, Swamiji, you're old. You'll never be able to survive the trip. It is too arduous. And even if you get there, what will you do? It is cold. And you will not find anything to eat there. So, because I, I care for you, I, I'm refusing you a ticket. I'm not going to give you a ticket because I know you will die if you go. <laughs> well, Prabhupada came back again, tried again. She gave the same answer. Three nights in a row, Prabhupada kept coming. Finally, Prabhupada decided, I'm, I'm going to sit at your doorstep until you give me the ticket. So Prabhupada stayed right by her door every day and didn't leave. He slept there until she gave him a ticket. <laughs> so you'd think it was easy for Prabhupada to get here. It wasn't easy at all. Finally she said, okay, I'll give you a ticket, but I don't think it's a good idea. So she arranged passage on this one, which was called the Jaladuta. You know, the word Jala means water, and Duta means messenger. <laughs> so the water messenger. <laughs> Interesting. So the Prabhupada got, finally he got passage. Now he tells his remaining family, the family's somewhat broken up now. So now he's going on his trip. So he has his umbrella and a little carrying case with a bag of cereal in the carrying case. And he arranged for his books to be put on the steam liner, which were um, about 200 books of the first Canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, volumes 1, 2, and 3. They've been re reprinted into a more, what we say, I have actually one of the original ones, the original one that one probably came over. It's falling apart. <laughs> it's like, you know, the, the whole binding is all practically off and everything. 
but it's such a collector's item, so I have that particular book. That's one of the books that Prabhupada brought over. But it's been reprinted into new volumes just to show what Prabhupada had done when he first came over with Srimad Bhagavatam. And um, so that's all he had, and he had 40 rupees. And that's like having nothing, because what are you going to do with rupees in America? <laughs> so he had no money. 40 rupees at that time was equal to seven dollars, if you could convert it. <laughs> that's all it was. <laughs> so that's all he had. His son, Vrindavan Day, accompanied him to the and you can see, you'll see the, the film of Prabhupada walking up the gangplank and getting onto the ship. And later on, Vrindavan Day, when, when he spoke about his father, he said, I was proud of him. <laughs> the rest of the family didn't like anything Prabhupada was doing. He had two, he had two other sons who were not at all favorable. His wife was, she had drifted away. He had two daughters that we never even heard about. We don't even know their names. Probably had five children. So he left everything, got on this ocean liner, and uh, for 39 days he was on, 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 the, on the ocean. Imagine being on a boat for 39 days. Whoa. And Prabhupada said, that when you're on the ocean, when the ocean is calm, it's foggy. And when the ocean is not foggy, it's rough. <laughs> and so Prabhupada had, he used to get seasick. And many times he would have to get seasick. He spent, he spent John Mastami that time, also at that time traveling over. And he writes about that, how he's missing all the devotees and on this wonderful occasion of the appearance of Lord Krishna, spending this time alone on this ocean liner in a little cabin, all by himself practically. Mr. Pandya, who was the captain of the ship, and his wife would sometimes prepare something for Srila Prabhupada. So they would help him in that way. But basically he was all alone. And during that time Prabhupada had two heart attacks. Two heart attacks. The second heart attack was more severe than the first. And when Prabhupada had his second heart attack, he felt like that was the end. And so he collapsed and was unconscious. And in that unconscious state, Krishna came to him in a dream. And what, what Krishna showed in the dream was, you can see that picture there, Krishna is in his different incarnations and he's rowing the boat. So you see a big boat and then there is different incarnations of Krishna and Krishna is rowing the boat in these different incarnations. So he gave assurance to Prabhupada, I'm taking you across. <laughs> You'll make it, don't worry. <laughs> so that was Prabhupada's second heart attack and then when, of course when he got to America he said before he got to America, because he landed in Boston Harbor on September 17th, uh, 1965, he said, when I got off the ship, it was 5.30 in the morning a.m., I didn't know whether to look right or to look left. I didn't know which way to go. <laughs> I was all alone. Finally, of course, he had a, a letter which brought him to he took a bus to New York, and then from New York, one man met him and took him to, finally they took him to, to uh, Sally Agarwal's, Gopal Agarwal's house in Butler, Pennsylvania, which was about an eight or nine hour car drive from New York. So, and in Prabhupada, you can, you, we all know that beautiful, beautiful poem, Mark King Dine, Bhagavad Dharma, and Prabhupada writes, he gets off the ship, gets back onto the ship and writes this poem. My dear Lord, why have you brought me here? The people of this place are so much steeped in, in passion and ignorance, 
how will they under, understand this message? But you are the great mystic, and by your arrangement, somehow or other, they will understand. I am your puppet. I've come to dance for you, so please make me dance, make me dance, oh Lord, make me dance. Prabhupada completely and utterly gave himself over to Krishna, and Krishna, you just take charge. I don't know why I'm here. <laughs> it's so cold. It's a foreign place. Hardly any place, anything was familiar. Nothing was familiar for Prabhupada. Everything was just so different. Seventy years old, never having been to America before, didn't know the culture, didn't know the people. He had English because, of course, in India they were speaking British English there, so he knew English, at least British English. And so Prabhupada really had to really work, work hard. What to speak about starting his mission just to get to America was a major, major, major endeavor. And of course he had two heart attacks and in 1967 he had his third heart attack. And after that, on the third heart attack, astrologer said, you, that was, you were meant to go at that time. That was the actually your karma, your, your life in this body had ended. But Krishna, he said, he, Prabhupada said, Krishna gave me ten more years. Because I was praying to Krishna, my mission has not even begun, please give me more time. Please give me more time. So Krishna extended my life for ten more years. And during that time, of course, Prabhupada spread Krishna consciousness all around the world. So we can see how much Prabhupada suffered and sacrificed just to start this movement. And what to speak of trying to organize the Krishna Conscious Society. Where did he go? Prabhupada said, I was coming to America hoping to find some first class men, people with some intelligence. I didn't find any first class. I didn't find any second class. <laughs> Only third and fourth class. One first class. Dumbledore, and he refers to Sarup Dumbledore Goswami, who was, uh, he was actually from Manipur, and he was also going to college in biochemistry in California. So probably he met Prabhupada around 1968 in uh, California. But before then, Prabhupada was just with a band of hippies. Some of them didn't even know what Prabhupada was talking about, but they liked him because he was a nice person. They could see he was a very caring and loving person. And he was interesting, he was unusual. When Prabhupada first came to America, he was walking along the streets. And one person came up to him and said, Are you from India? And Prabhupada said back, said to him, Are you from India? <laughs> he was an American. <laughs> this was Hayagriva, the original Hayagriva. And then uh, Hayagriva and Kirtananda Swami and had gone to India looking for a guru. And they came back without finding one. But then they met their guru in America. <laughs> they went to India looking for a guru. When they came back, they found one in their own hometown. <laughs> Srila Prabhupada. So, in those days, Prabhupada didn't have any money, practically nothing. Of course, he lived in Butler, Pennsylvania before then for about six weeks with Sally Agarwal and Gopal. And that was a difficult time. Prabhupada was getting accustomed to the American ways. And at some time, it was difficult for the family to keep Prabhupada there, so they arranged for him to stay in the YMCA. And so he stayed there regularly. And Prabhupada, once in a while, would, he, uh, there was one college in Butler, Pennsylvania. What was the name of that college? Uh, Slippery Rock College. It's interesting, you know, because nobody knows this, but one person who became a devotee 
saw Prabhupada at Simply Slippery Rock College before Prabhupada even got to to uh, to uh, New York, and that was Ravinder Swaroop. He saw Prabhupada later on. He he actually told me this. He said, "I I saw this saintly person walking on campus." Now I understood it was Srila Prabhupada. Of course, he didn't meet him, but he had just happened to see him. So that was in 1965, mm -hmm. when Prabhupada first got to Butler, Pennsylvania. So then, of course, later, when Prabhupada finally got to New York, they put him on the bus, and he took a bus to, uh, you know, from Butler, Pennsylvania back to, to New York. And Prabhupada basically had no place to stay, and then of course he was living in different places. And then uh, you can read, the early days is one volume, Prabhupada describes what it was like day to day. Prabhupada decided to try to start his movement in the uptown part of uh, New York, where people were a little bit more richer. So he met one man called Dr. Mishra, and Dr. Mishra, was a kind of a, like a sadhu. He was an impersonalist, and he was inviting Westerners to come. These people were a little bit wealthy, and they would come to listen to Dr. Mishra. So Prabhupada and him somehow or other met together, and they became friends. But some, sometimes Dr. Mishra would be speaking, and he would be speaking Mayavadi philosophy, and Prabhupada would be sitting there going, <laughs> <laughs> like that. And his students would be wondering what's going on. <laughs> Prabhupada could never tolerate, you know, Mayavadi philosophy. So sometimes him and Dr. Mishra would have big arguments. But, but Dr. Mishra uh, one time fell sick and Prabhupada cooked for him. And Dr. Mishra said, he helped me with my health. He got my health back because he cooked nicely for me. <laughs> So like that, so they became friends, although they were on opposite ends in the spiritual philosophy, like that. And one of the persons who was a follower of Dr. Mishra later on, he came and met the devotees and told the whole, practically the whole story of them together, Dr. Mishra and uh, Prabhupada in, the, in those early days. That was recorded. Like that. So, uh, when you read the early days of Prabhupada's life, I hope many of hope of devotees have read Satyarup Maharaj's account. Do you have that? The uh, Satyarup's biography on Prabhupada's life? Yeah, yeah. Devotees have read that? If you haven't read it, then you don't know what this movement is about. <laughs> it's really, really the most amazing account of Prabhupada's struggle to start this Hare Krishna movement. There's so many details of Prabhupada. And Prabhupada met different people. Prabhupada was trying to sell his Bhagavatams in bookstores in those days. He would carry his books from bookstore to bookstore in New York and ask the proprietor, the owner of the bookstore, can you take these books? And many times they would say, well, we have so many spiritual books, but nobody buys them, so we're not interested. <laughs> but Prabhupada had a hard time selling his books. There's one story where he went to this one shop, which was basically a clothing shop, but had some books they also sold. So he came in, and then he showed the man the book, and the man said, well, these spiritual books they don't sell. Prabhupada said, that's all right, you just take the book, and uh, if it gives, if it sells, you can give me some commission. So the man said, all right. So he took the book. So Prabhupada left, and Prabhupada came back the next day and asked, did the book sell? <laughs> the man said, I told you these books don't sell. <laughs> so then Prabhupada left. So Prabhupada came back the next day <laughs> and asked again. And uh, the man said, the book, the, you know, it, it's... So then the man had a little table there, so Prabhupada sat down. And Prabhupada said to the, man, to the man, can you give me a glass of water? And the man said, well, the water's over there. <laughs> In other words, get up and get it yourself. 
So, but uh, his wife, the bookseller owner's wife, he, she, she brought him, she, he, she said to her husband, get him a glass of water. <laughs> so he listened to his wife. And so he gave Prabhupada a glass of water. Prabhupada drank half the glass of water and left. The next day the book sold. <laughs> he did some he did some seva for a saintly person. Just by that seva to a saintly person, things happened. So these were Prabhupada's adventures trying to sell his books. One time he went shopping in this little tiny grocery store. And they had little baskets that you wheel, and you put your items in the ba in the baskets, and then you go up to the cash register. Well, Prabhupada put a few items in the basket, and the lady at the checkout, she rings it up, and it came to $11.55. So she said that would be $11.55. Prabhupada said, it's only worth $5. <laughs> <laughs> She said, excuse me, sir, the price is eleven fifty-five. He said, it's not worth it, it's only worth five dollars. <laughs> because, you know, in India, you bargain. Anywhere you go in any shop, you never pay the price, you always kind of haggle and see if you can, because they always give you a higher price and then you get it down like that. That's just, this is Indian business, you know. <laughs> so, the lady said, all right, so she took Prabhupada's five dollars, and later on she met the devotees, she said, I paid the rest out of my own pocket, <laughs> because I thought he was such a nice person. <laughs> she just liked Prabhupada. <laughs> Prabhupada had his way of just attracting people like that. So these are some of the things that Prabhupada went through, and there's so many amazing stories on how you know, living from place to place, living with one crazy hippie who was telling, taking LSD, Dr. Richard. Dr. Richard overtook, took an overdose of LSD one time and came at Prabhupada to cause him harm. Prabhupada saw it, he just turned around and walked out of the apartment and never came back. He left all this stuff. <laughs> So, these are just some of the adventures that Prabhupada had to go through to start it. Prabhupada had started his movement, and of course even the devotees who were coming in those days, they were doing all kinds of, you know, spiritual things that they had learned on their own, because God, spirituality was like a, a fad during the hippie era. People would try all kinds of stuff. So one time, Prabhupada was there, and he was in his little section, and it was a curtain, and the rest of the devotees, well, the guests, were doing all kinds of spiritual things. And so one man came in, and he saw Prabhupada, and he said to the Prabhupada, well, what are these people doing? Prabhupada said, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what they're doing either. <laughs> So, you see, it, probably, it wasn't easy to convince people to, to take the Krishna consciousness because they had, we had so many ideas of what spirituality was like, you know. There were so many mystics and poems and so many tantrics and so many far-out spiritual ideas that, that were permeating. The bookstores started to get all these books on various types of spirituality. And so people had all kinds of mishmash ideas of spirituality. So Prabhupada had to cut through that. It, was, it wasn't easy. Mukunda was one of the first persons to come to Srila Prabhupada. And he writes in one of his books, uh, I think he writes his, his biography of Prabhupada. He said, I was sitting with Prabhupada in the car, and Prabhupada. Uh, Prabhupada had a date in his hand, you know, a little dried fruit. So Prabhupada took a bite out of the date and he handed it to Mukunda. Mukunda was thinking, what is this? He's taking a bite and he's handing it to me. <laughs> so I thought, all right. So I took a bite and he handed it back to Prabhupada. <laughs> 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 Prabhupada said, that's all right. <laughs> Say, what do you speak about etiquette, you know? <laughs> Nobody knew what etiquette was. 
So, and this was like one thing after another Prabhupada had to go through. <laughs> There was one book, I, I think I saw it in your bookshop called Blazing Sadhus. Please read that book. It, that, that'll blow your mind. <laughs> How many of you read it? Anybody? Did you read it? Oh my God, if you haven't read that book, oh, I don't know what to say. <laughs> that book you won't be able to put down. You can't stop reading it. I read it twice. I know some devotees have read it three times. <laughs> it is so amazing. It was done by a Chutananda. Chutananda is really a brain. He's, he's super intelligent. But he was one of the first devotees. And uh, the subtitle of the book is Never Trust a Holy Man Who Can't Dance. <laughs> That's the, that's the uh, subtitle of the book. Where did he get the title from? When they were doing kirtan at 26-2nd Avenue, when Prabhupada was dancing like this, he was dancing. And uh, so Achyutananda was looking and thinking, what is this, you know? You know, this dancing, you know? Because, you know, in those days, everybody was just reading books and philosophizing and discussing, you know? And then Hayagriva could see Achyutananda was bewildered, so he came up to Achyutananda and he said, Never trust a holy man who can't dance. <laughs> so, this is, these are some of the oldies. Please read that book, Blazing Sadhus. It will... And Naranjan Swami, he's, I mean, he's just like, he said, I read it two, two times. I read it twice. I mean, I could read it again. It's just like an amazing book. It's one of the first accounts of the early days of Krishna consciousness and back in when Srila Prabhupada first began his movement like that. So, if you don't have any money, just steal the book. <laughs> that was one of the, I don't know if you, you none of you were part of the hippie movement. I was. I was kind of like on the fringe of the heavy movement yeah. during that time. So there was one book that was put out by a, one radical. The book was called Steal This Book. <laughs> that was the title of the book. And they put it on their shelves. <laughs> so that book didn't make much money. <laughs> Abby Hoffman and what's the other person's name? The other guy who was his, his sidekick. And of course, finally, Prabhupada met uh, Allen Ginsberg, who was a poet, and, and Ginsberg and his girlfriend, who was a boy. <laughs> See, you know, he was writing all kinds, he was the hero of the hippie generation. He wrote one book one called Howl. And somehow or other, he used to chant Hare Krishna. He would chant. I forgot what tune he used to do. He had a little ukulele, and he would chant Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. <laughs> he had been to India, and he had heard them singing, so he came back and he started. So. Because he had chanted Hare Krishna, somehow he met Srila Prabhupada. And Prabhupada talked to him. There's a lot of discussions. There's actually tape lectures that are recorded. And then Allen Ginsberg arranged for Prabhupada in California, when Prabhupada's movement went out to California, to go to this, uh, uh, what was the name of that ballroom? Mantra Rock. Yeah, Mantra Rock. <laughs> It was a series of all the bands, Moby Grape, The Grateful Dead, Janis Joplin, all these... Mishri, you getting excited? <laughs> He's writing all this down. <laughs> so there was this big, big thing that was organized. And so Allen Ginsberg arranged for Prabhupada to come and be part of that program. And you know, in those days, 
people, everybody who came to those things, they were completely stoned out on drugs. You know, peyote, LSD, marijuana, whatever you can think of. Nobody came to those events, you know, normal. <laughs> And then they had all these strobe lights, you know, like flashing. <laughs> Prabhupada, when he came there, he said, no place for a brahmachari. <laughs> <laughs> so Prabhupada came, and Prabhupada led kirtan, and the place went wild. <laughs> it went completely wild. Prabhupada spoke, and then he led kirtan. And Allen Ginsberg was pumping up the crowd because he was a hero of all these hippies, you know. So Prabhupada. And then, actually, one of the band members from Moby Grape actually came later the next day and joined the Hare Krishna movement and got initiated. <laughs> but one brahmachari that came with Prabhupada never came back. <laughs> so he lost one and gained one. <laughs> Never bring your never bring your brahmacharis to a strobe like event. You know? <laughs> so yeah, and so yeah, this is this. So Prabhupada went. To, Prabhupada would go anywhere just to preach. It didn't matter where. He even went to a what is it? Um, one of these places where what is it called? Where people don't have any clothes. <laughs> <laughs> They, they, their, their program is they live naked and they, they, they just hang around. That's all. They, they never wear clothes to, for 24 hours, you know. <laughs> what do they call those places? Uh, uh, and Prabhupada went <laughs> because somebody arranged for him to go. <laughs> and he actually met one devotee who later became Tamal Krishna Goswami. <laughs> he was there as one of the participants. <laughs> I was out in California. Yeah. So Prabhupada went every, anywhere just to preach because in those days, that's all there was, you know, just just hippies arranging for his programs like that. It was called Something Farm. It was in, the, in, in somewhere in California. California has good weather 20, all year round, so, you know. Uh, yeah, so this, this is what Prabhupada had to go through. <laughs> to spread Krishna consciousness. It wasn't easy. <laughs> one time, <laughs> Prabhupada was leading kirtan, and one girl, she was on LSD, and she took off all her clothes and started to dance. <laughs> Prabhupada's eyes went, <laughs> and then Malati came running around and threw some blanket over her. You know? <laughs> so, yeah, you know, this was like people were stoned out. And then, of course, they were in one building, and the next building over next to it was the, the Hell's Angels. So the Hell's Angels would have their kirtan, too, and they would be banging on the walls and crashing, and it was being wild over there with rock and roll. <laughs> so you think Krishna consciousness is hard, huh? <laughs> in those days, it was impossible. But Prabhupada tolerated everything, you know. He went through all that just because he knew that if he stuck with it, people, because people were coming, people were coming. They were coming. They were bringing their dogs and joining the movement. <laughs> Some soon to brought his dog called Ralph. That was the name of the dog. He had a dog named Ralph. <laughs> so yeah, this was like, you know, as was the old days. But then Prabhupada stuck, but he, if you read, he listened to his lectures in the old days, he's speaking straight Krishna conscious philosophy. Even talking from Chaitanya Charitamrita back in 1966, giving classes on it. Listen to those old, old lectures in the original time. Really sweet. Prabhupada's just trying to explain to people who don't have any idea about Vedic culture or Vedic knowledge, what Krishna consciousness is. But, but somehow, they liked Prabhupada. Everyone liked Prabhupada. Although they didn't understand him, and they found it difficult to follow him, still they liked Prabhupada. That was the thing. He attracted everybody's heart. 
And after a while, when the movement started to grow more, devotees were just doing any, anything to, to satisfy Srila Prabhupada. So uh, for many, for the first few years, it was really difficult. His movement really didn't take off until 1969, 60, from 65 to 69. Very difficult, times very difficult. In 1968, something was started to happen. 67 is when he had his heart attack, his third heart attack. They put him in a, he went into a hospital and he didn't like it in the hospital. <laughs> he didn't like it at all. Because <laughs> they were doing all kinds of tests on him. So he told Brahmananda, who was one of his first students, get me out of here. So Brahmananda came one night time in the middle of the night with a wheelchair and put Prabhupada in the wheelchair and start taking him out of the room and wheeling him out of the hospital. The nurses happened to be there and they saw him. They started running after him. You're going to, hey, what are you doing? You can't take him out. You're going to kill him. Prabhupada said, keep going. <laughs> Get me out of here. <laughs> Later, he told Brahmananda, he said, because you saved me from that hospital, you will not have to die in the hospital. He told that to Brahmananda. Interesting story, when Brahmananda, Brahmananda left the, the planet about two years ago, June 2018, he was in Vrindavan, his health was really bad. Gopal Krishna Maharaj was trying to arrange for him to go to Delhi to get treatment at the hospital. Brahmananda who didn't want to go. Finally, Gopal Krishna was really encouraging. So finally, Brahmananda agreed. And so they sent an ambulance to Vrindavan to pick up Brahmananda and take him. As soon as he got up from his chair to walk to the ambulance, he collapsed and died in Vrindavan. Prabhupada said, because you, because you uh, saved me from the hospital, you would not have to die in a hospital. Died in Vrindavan. And that's auspicious. That was really auspicious. Yeah, so these are some of the many stories of the old days, which are so full of adventure and excitement. Uh, Sham Sundar Prabhu has written two books called Chasing the Rhinos. That'll give you a really, really, really detailed and a very interesting account of what happened in the early days. He has a third volume yet to be published, but these two volumes, I saw volume one in the gift shop here, but. Volume 2 is out. I read Volume 2. <laughs> it's amazing. Sham Sundar has an amazing ability to write. How the movement went to London and we, we met the Beatles and what happened there. It's really... The history of this movement is amazing. And so many devotees have written from different angles of vision how Srila Prabhupada started this movement and the experiences that they went through in helping Prabhupada spread the movement. It's really quite amazing, amazing history. But Prabhupada, it wasn't easy for Prabhupada, even after his movement was started, because he had to deal with people who weren't always working together in a cooperative way. So he had a lot of, there was a lot of times the devotees were disagreeing with each other, fighting with each other, and Prabhupada had to deal with it. There was no GBC. <laughs> Prabhupada, tried to, Prabhupada started the GBC in 1970, but still, it wasn't really functioning much as, an, uh, as a management group. Finally, after some years, Prabhupada got it going. It wasn't until 1977, the last year, Prabhupada was here, that the GBC actually started to organize in a functional way. So, yeah, Prabhupada was practically, he was the translator, he was the preacher, he was the, uh, he was the settler of arguments, he was the, he was everything. <laughs> Prabhupada did everything. Anytime there was any problem, anytime there was any need, Prabhupada was consulted. We read the letters that Prabhupada wrote to his disciples. We have accounts of them. But Ravinda Saruprabhu, 
when after Prabhupada disappeared, he happened to find the trunk of all the letters that the devotees had sent to Prabhupada. We don't read those. We never saw those letters. What were the letters that devotees actually wrote to Srila Prabhupada? Prabhupada kept every one of those letters. And Ravinda Sarupa actually said that it was one problem after another. <laughs> the devotees were struggling and Prabhupada had to deal with so many difficulties. At the same time, translate his books, manage the organization, travel. So what Prabhupada did is, uh, we can't just like, it just doesn't fit anywhere into anyone's, uh, what we say, understanding. It just, it's phenomenal. And all you can say is that he was fully empowered by Krishna. And it was just amazing. So today is actually the anniversary of Prabhupada's arrival in America. Many years ago, when I was in America, we used to have a festival, and still goes on, but now it's not as grand. Every year we would uh, celebrate this day by having a three-day festival and have programs in honor of Srila Prabhupada. And part of those programs, we would go down to the place where Prabhupada first came, which was the docks in the uh, Boston Harbor, where Prabhupada's ship landed. And we would go there at 5.30 in the morning, have kirtan and speak, and talk about Prabhupada's coming to this place. One year we rented a big yacht and had a big festival and we toured all over the, you know, the uh, harbor with the yacht. I have pictures of that, so that was nice. Yeah, so this is a very uh, significant day in the history of our movement, the appearance of Srila Prabhupada in the Western world. And that was uh, 55 years ago. This year is the 55th year, like that. So our movement's quite young when you look at it. But you see, in in a short period of time, from 1966 to 1977, how fast Krishna consciousness spread around the world. It's amazing when you think about it. And it was all because of Prabhupada and how he inspired people to give their lives to, to spread Krishna consciousness. It's most amazing. So we're all, like say, a product of that those early days of sacrifice done by Prabhupada and his devotees. So now we have to see how to keep this mood, this spirit that Prabhupada created in the early days of reaching out and bringing more and more people into Krishna consciousness, coming up with more and more ways to attract the conditioned souls. In those days, people were interested in a lot of new things, but as time went on, when the 90s came, in the 2000s, people became very conservative. In the early days, people weren't so conservative. They were always looking for something new, some adventure like that. So Krishna consciousness was something that people took interest in because it was new, it was different, it was Indian. Now people are not interested in all that. So we always have to come up with ways to somehow attract the conditioned souls to, to take part in this movement. Of course, Kirtan and Prashad and Prabhupada said these are the best two ways, especially in this age of Kali, where people are not so inclined to understand philosophy. He said these are the ways that we, we should really emphasize our movement. Mass Prashadam distribution and Kirtans, Harinams, Harinams and Kirtan programs, inviting more and more people to come. Because he said, and these, these two features will, will attract practically everybody, especially Prashadam. <laughs> okay, so we went a little bit over time. So that's a little bit about the early days. Uh, so there's many, many wonderful books to read. Satsurup Maharaj's um, what was that title then again? Lilamrita. Lilamrita. Six volumes, 
five volumes, no, six volumes, plus the seventh volume was put out later. Seven volumes, about 300 pages each, plus some of the devotees who have written. Brahmananda wrote his book in the early days. Achyutananda wrote his book. Hayagriva wrote two books in the early days, like that. So, And Shambhasundar now is just completing his third in book, which will be out soon, called uh, Ch Chasing the Rhino. Well, yeah, Mukunda, also, like that. Who else? Uh, I asked Malati to write. She's always too shy to write. She, she always gives me some excuse why she can't write, but anyway. But she's, she's written little things on the side that she keeps more confidential. Who else was in there in the old days? Of course, Sats Rup Maharaj has written so many books about Prabhupada in the early days. Not only did, not only the Lilamrita, but many others. Yeah, that's pretty much it <laughs> as far as writers. But there's a lot there. Okay, any anyone would like to comment or maybe. Ask a question? No? Okay, yes? Um, could I just... Um, could, could you please um, explain why did um, Krishna arrange so um, difficult path for Prabhupada even after he completely surrendered to him? Good question. It's a very good question. Because Prabhupada, Krishna wanted to show what this person is made of, that he's willing to do anything to spread my movement. If Prabhupada, if everything was easy, it wouldn't, Prabhupada wouldn't be so glorious. <laughs> so Krishna was always there, but he didn't make it so easy. I mean, Krishna could have gave him an airline ticket from Bombay to New York. But he didn't. He had to go on a boat for 39 days. <laughs> yeah, that question has been asked. Basically, we understand that this is the glory of Srila Prabhupada. He's not only a great scholar of the Vedas, that he is also completely sold out on a personal level, using his intelligence and his determination to spread Krishna consciousness. And there's another reason, that's an example for all of us to also, that we should develop at least some, to some degree some of that, that shakti that Prabhupada had in our practice of Krishna consciousness. There are devotees in our movement that don't like easy times, they like difficulties. Why? Because they say it brings out the best in you. <laughs> so, if you like things going easy, you're in the wrong movement. <laughs> <laughs> because Krishna consciousness is a guaranteed success, but you have to fight for it. And if you're not willing to fight, you lose. <laughs> as long as you're willing to fight for it, on an individual level and also to preach. Because that's the way of the world. The world doesn't want this. They want sense gratification. They want economic gain. So we're going completely against the whole trend of the world like that. So Krishna consciousness is a fight. But if you enjoy fights, some to be, yeah. We like good fights, right? It brings out the best in you. Of course, we don't want to fight amongst ourselves. That's not the idea. <laughs> but we have to fight that laziness, that complacency within ourselves. That's what we have to fight. And also, when, we, when we're out there preaching, we should know how to spread Krishna consciousness and deal with oppositions like that. That's Your country's a little different. 
Prabhupada said the Americans, they don't take anything. You have to really convince them. <laughs> They're not easy to convince. <laughs> And they Prabhupada said they, they challenge everything. And they, and they challenge Prabhupada too. <laughs> Even Prabhupada was their guru, they would still challenge Prabhupada. <laughs> That's the way the Americans are. They never take things for, for granted. You have to really prove that you got something before they'll, they'll be convinced like that. Indians are not like that. They'll go along. But, uh, but it's not like they're pessimistic. They have a positive outlook, but at the same time they want to be convinced that it, this is what is the real stuff. <laughs> Pessimism doesn't work in spiritual life. Pessimism means to doubt everything and then go away. But. Uh, Challenge to question is good because it oh, it helps you clear up all your doubts and gives you more understanding of what is what is correct. Good, good. Thank you for that question. Yeah. Thank you, Maharaj. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we stop here. Thank you. Shri Prabhupada Ki Jai Bhimarande Hari Hari Shri Prabhupada's arrival in the U.S. Ki Jai Shri Prabhupada starting the ISKCON movement in New York City Ki Jai Shri Prabhupada in Ljubljana Ki Jai Jai